As you look back at the progression of your watch collecting journey, you can begin to recall watches that managed to leave you captivated during those different stages. One of those watches for me was with this watch, the Junghans Maxbo Chronoscope. This is a watch that I have owned now for six years, and I can directly recall my fascination with the design culminating in me buying this watch on a lunch break at work six years ago. But with having this watch in my collection all this time, I wanted to revisit it, offering my take as a long-term owner, both the good and not so good. Let's jump into it. So a big reason for my love of this watch is a result of the original work of Swiss designer Max Bill. Now he didn't technically design the chronoscope that we have here, but he did design the framework for which this model is based, now encompassing a collection with dozens of different variations. And if you are interested in learning more about the Max Bill collection, having a comprehensive understanding of it, including the history, approach to design, and the different models out there, I'll have a very helpful article down below in the description where we give the complete backstory of the design process and the models available. That'll be a great jumping off point if you want to understand more of the mystique behind Max Bill and his designs. Now, since the design of this watch is such an important aspect to the conversation, let's identify the original nexus of Max Bill and Junghans, a connection that was made in the 1950s. During the period, Junghans was working on a new project involving a kitchen clock and decided to enlist Swiss designer Max Bill to lead. Max Bill studied at the highly regarded Bauhaus, a German school of design that was in operation from 1919 to 1933. But even with that short operation, their teachings are now pervasive in modern architecture and industrial design. After the success of the kitchen clock that included a timer along with a clean and proportioned layout, Junghans was interested in adapting some of the characteristics of the design and infusing it within a wristwatch. And in 1961, Junghans released the Max Bill wristwatch, a timepiece defined by its slender bezel, diminutive lugs, curved crystal, and clean typeface. This line became a staple in the brand's collection, now including dozens of variations, one of them of course being the Max Bill Chronoscope. Now the Chronoscope wasn't designed specifically by Max Bill, however, the original Max Bill design is unmistakable within its layout. If I had to get to the core of why this watch spoke to me at the beginning, it simply came down to the design and how the principle of simplicity is upheld while adding a chronograph and never coming across as reductive. The case comes in at 40 millimeters, slightly larger than that of the 38 millimeter Max Bill automatic case with a lug to lug of only 42 millimeters. One defining characteristic of this watch that was lost on me when I first purchased it was how the actual watch itself is essentially completely dial. The bezel is slim and the lugs add nothing to the case length, in turn making the eyes lock with the star of the show at the center. Thickness on this piece is 13.9 millimeters, a thickness that is certainly on the larger end. However, nearly two millimeters of that are coming from that heavily domed plexiglass crystal on top. This inclusion of a plexiglass crystal is probably the number one point of contention when people discuss this model or are looking to buy from us on our site, which I totally understand because this is a $2,000 watch at the end of the day. The choice for this crystal type though was a result of the design and the warm hue that plexiglass gives off compared to the likes of Sapphire while remaining true to the original. This said, in recent years, Junghans has begun to offer Sapphire retrofitting for these watches at an upcharge, which has been a big hit in offering people more peace of mind when it comes to the durability department. Now, in my time owning this watch, I've had no issues with the plexiglass and picking up scratches, but I tend to not be as hard on this one as well. But you can see from the rest of the case that it's picking up scratches on the polished surfaces, so it's not like I'm completely babying this thing. And I will say that Junghans did a really nice job with the sapphire options and keeping that photogenic nature that is usually reserved for these plexiglass crystals. From the case standpoint, it has a bulbous saucer look to it with a rounded case back that almost perfectly mirrors the curvature of the crystal and and helps the watch not sit so high on the wrist. All visible sides of the case are high polish, including the three protruding elements on the right side of the case with those pump pushers and an unsigned crown. Now wearing this one on the wrist is honestly unlike almost any other watch that I have tried as a result of the compact lug to lug and the distinct dial to bezel ratio. The watch wears like a true 40 millimeters across, yet with the minuscule lugs, you almost have an effect of a completely lugless design, never risking overhang even on the smallest of wrists. In tandem with this unorthodox dimension set, the 
weight of this watch is also remarkably light, as you will sometimes forget you even have it on, apart from when shaking the wrist in a dramatic way. Why, you might ask? Well, since the case is rather light, the rotation of the unidirectional winding rotor is easy to feel spinning. This is a reality to some degree with every value powered watch, but it is even more noticeable with this design uh, compared to the average and can leave you worrying about if there's something maybe loose in your watch if you were not prepared for this when you first purchase it. Apart from their tiny stature, the lugs are 20 millimeters wide, offering a perfect two to one ratio with the case and enabling endless possibilities for straps. And I mean endless. This watch does come with a light tan calfskin strap, but to me, it is a missed opportunity to only keep that strap on this watch. I have thrown everything at this piece, from the likes of NATO straps, which I have on it right now, which I think it actually looks great, uh, different reptilian leather straps that are more dressy, all different types of calf skin straps. Everything looks solid because it's a perfect middle ground between chronograph, sporty elements, with the max build design that leans dressy. Speaking further to the dial itself, when understanding the backstory of the wall clock influence here, you can begin to spot some of the carryover with the end result, mostly with the dial curvature. So at the outskirts of the dial, the center surface curves towards the case back, following a similar plane as the crystal, creating an illusion that the dial is jumping out, screaming to be seen. This effect is one of those aspects that is overlooked and I did not recognize immediately owning it, although it is without a doubt part of the magic here. At the periphery, small numeral markings rest at every five minutes, sitting outside linear markings in loom plots at the every 15 minutes, with a dual plot at the 12 o'clock. Set directly inward is what I would call another unmistakable element of the max bill design, the numerals indicating the hours in a lovely typeface that has become inextricably linked with this model family. All the design traits to this point have been rather conventional compared to the rest of the max bill family, but that's when the chronograph registers come into play. The layout here follows the conventional vertical register display dictated by the Valju 7750 with a 30 minute counter at 12 and a 12 hour counter at six. Instead of a running 60 seconds, you have the writing of Junghans chronoscope at nine and a date window at three that has subtle faceting of the window itself. At the center, hands containing loom accompany a steel chronograph second hand to complete the dial. The omission of a running 60 seconds is strange, but in turn, it does offer symmetry across the dial with the text mirroring the date window and the registers balancing one another out. Flipping this watch over, we have a steel polished case back protecting the Valju 7750 movement within. Now, Valju is perhaps the most famous name in the world of chronographs from a third party perspective. And the 7750 is probably the most ubiquitous of all their offerings. The 7750 is a fully integrated chronograph movement that is cam actuated and is the choice for many entry level mechanical chronographs looking for a Swiss movement. There are modular setup options such as the ETA 2894 that is also popular and features the chronograph module on top of its base caliber, but the value is often preferred and seen as more premium as a result of the integrated architecture, which in turn tends to be preferred by watchmakers in the servicing arena. The movement is larger in stature. We're looking at 30 millimeters wide by eight millimeters thick and is automatically wound by way of its unidirectional rotor. In terms of general operation for this movement, you're looking at 28,800 vibrations per hour, four Hertz. It does feature hacking and hand winding at a power reserve of 48 hours. And then in terms of accuracy, we tested this one across five different positions. It was testing between plus seven to plus nine seconds a day across those positions. Again, I've had this watch for over six years now. So I think that does speak to the level of accuracy maintained by this watch uh, for quite some time. But now with the review out of the way and looking at this watch, let's talk about my take on it because I've owned this one for six years. I know many people have asked me questions about this watch in the, in the past. And uh, this is one of those watches that was featured in the first video on this channel ever. And ever since has been one of the most complimented watches that I own and still to this day, even though I don't wear it as much as I used to, it still always gets questions here and there from people that are able to lock eyes with them. So first let's discuss some of the things I don't like as a long-term owner of this, and then we'll talk about things I do like. Now the first thing here is the lack of a 60 second sub register uh, for your standard seconds, which I find in a chronograph is a weird omission. I personally would love to be able to swap that 12 hour register because I don't typically use it with 60 seconds but I think that would create some challenges when it comes to modifying the movement, so I understand it. And also it does come in with this beautiful symmetry that I think is what drew me into this piece initially. So 
weird, something I can live without, but certainly something that certain times when it comes to just being able to time the specific moment, uh, it is one thing that's lacking. And I would find myself maybe running the chronograph more than usual to see kind of that sweeping secondhand effect. Now the next thing is, and I think this is probably the bigger thing, is this watch, although it, it's rather expensive. It doesn't necessarily always feel like a $2,000 watch. I think the number one th reason why is this rotor jiggle. Now it doesn't bother me. Now it doesn't bother me when I have it on the wrist. It kind of reminds me that I have a mechanical watch on, but it is so loud. And uh, it also is very noticeable on the wrist. It, you can feel it just rotating on your wrist when you really jostle your wrist around uh, freely. And just as an example, I don't know if you can hear that. Maybe you can, but this thing is loud. Uh, it can surprise people. If you've never handled the value movement before, it, it might just creep up on you and you're like, okay, what was that? Is, is everything okay with my watch? That's the case for many value powered movements, but even more the case with this. It might just be like this bulbous case and just how it's structured, it just echoes inside more than usual. I might be exaggerating it a tad, but this is just something that I notice for people that probably are just getting into these movements for the first time, might be taken back by this when they first get it. We can also talk about plexiglass. I've had no issue with this, but talking about maybe the durability and just this watch maybe being a tad delicate. Uh, it's more of like a dress chronograph for lack of a better term. That plexiglass could put some people off. Now with the Sapphire options, I think this is less of an issue. When I was initially buying this watch, that was just straight up not an option. So uh, that is now available for an upcharge and that's something that we get all the time for customers of our site too, uh, looking for that Sapphire uh, retrofit. But now let's get into the things I like about this watch. And there are also many things that I do like. And there's a reason why I still own this watch. I've sold many of my watches, but this one has remained. And I think it really comes down to design. When I saw this watch, there was nothing else like it. And I think still to this day, if you want Junghans, like people will ask like, hey, what's a good alternative to Junghans? I don't think there really is. They're not cheap watches, but they're also watches that I think are priced in a range where if you work hard and you uh, wanna have one of these watches, I think for most people, it's very much an attainable brand to get into. And if you like this design, kind of that modern approach or contemporary approach, or that mid 20th century approach is what I should say, uh, this watch just speaks to people and it spoke to me. I remember seeing just the symmetry, the use of negative space, the display of the registers, and also how the dial just takes up so much a part of the design. And there was almost something like ineffable about this watch. It, I don't know what it was, but it left me entranced and I, I just love the look of it. Some people are gonna find it very sterile. Uh, and that's fine, but there's something so balanced and in control about this that I enjoyed. Another thing I love about this watch, you can have a blast with straps. Back when I purchased this watch, I just remember giving it different looks all the time with different straps. Pretty much anything works with this. And getting to the reason why, I think it's because when you look at a chronograph, people lean into the sporty nature of what a chronograph can bring. So you have optionality with even like NATO straps, Perlon straps, rubber straps, a rally strap would probably look great on this thing too. And then you factor in the max build design and you have so much flexibility with dress watches. Like you can put this on a shell a cordovan strap and it would look amazing. And I think that's a great thing about this watch because the design is so balanced, it does have the ability to work with so many different straps. The other thing I will say about this watch is it does speak to people that might not be infected with the watch bug. I always will get looks or questions about this watch from people that uh, maybe you're not into watches, not from the like the flexing aspect, because that's that's you know obvious. Like if you have something that's very ostentatious, blingy, people are going to be attracted to that watch. But this watch doesn't really give off that vibe, but it still has a way to captivate people when you wear it on the wrist. And I think it really comes down to the look of the dome crystal and just like what are pe people are looking at that, like what's going on there. There's like no bezel. It just looks like it's a floating dial at certain times. So it just grabs people's attention in the right way. And for non-watch enthusiasts, I just find there's something that attracts them to this. And for somebody that does what I do, I think that's always cool to find certain watches that can do that. And then the final point why I enjoy this watch, I think comes down to sentimental value and then also, again, just that design. I remember the time in my life when I liked this watch, I fell in love with this watch. And that was when I was working in software, I was very much obsessed with like UX, user experience. And there was something about that in the, in the midst of thinking about design, this watch stood out. And when you get down to what makes great design, to me, when you're looking at it from a user experience uh, side of things from a website, or from a software solution, it's usually when you're dealing with something that 
it's intuitive. Every action is subconscious and your eyes or the way that you will interact with something is just done without even thinking. The reality is most great things when it comes to design are the things that you don't notice. And when handling this watch, I noticed there's a very similar thing that happened here. When I look at this watch, sure, it's a clean looking design, but when I learned more about it, when I learned about Max Bill, the wall clock, the adaption from that to a wrist watch, you start to begin to appreciate what this thing is doing. And you have this slender bezel, you have very small lugs. What it's doing with extending out that dial with the curvature of the dial, it allows the dial to go center stage. You appreciate that more. When I look at this watch, I look at great design. I look at maybe the small subconscious features that maybe you weren't able to appreciate at a time, but now you're able to connect the dots more as you start to handle more watches. And although I don't wear it as much as I used to, this will always be part of my journey. And I think that's what watches are all about. And this one encapsulates a part of my journey in a really great way. But all right guys, that is my take on the Junghans Maxville Chronoscope. This watch is not for everybody. And I think some people are gonna say after, oh, great, great little uh, talk there, Teddy, but I don't really think the watch is for me. But that's what also makes this all great at the end of the day. But if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. If you own this watch or you like this watch, I'd love to hear some user experiences as well. You know, what is your take on this? Uh, have you opted for a Sapphire version uh, now with those becoming available? What is your take on that? I just have experience more with the plexiglass from a day-to-day -day wearing standpoint, but I've always been fascinated with this watch and again, will just remain part of my journey. Also be sure to check out that Junghans Max Bill article down below. It's a helpful guide into understanding more of the backstory of Max Bill, the Junghans connection as a brand so that you can probably further appreciate uh, the watch that we have here. Also definitely check out teddyballstar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. Also, if you wanna stay up to date with the content, two great places to go. Instagram to see some great photos of watches in the process, but also subscribe to our newsletter where you get dedicated written content completely separate from the content that we're creating on our YouTube channel here. But all right guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I'll see you all very soon.